Greetings and salutations, I am Professor Tabletop, or Michael if you prefer. Uh, this video is going to be a continuation of the campaign diaries that I started two weeks ago. So the last video went over the first, second, and third session of my campaign. This video is going to cover the fourth, fifth, and sixth session of my campaign. I'm hoping this video is going to be a lot shorter, as there isn't a lot that I have to explain, since I explained a lot in the first uh, video. If you want to check out the first video, I highly recommend it. It gives you a lot more information on the players and kind of the world. For this video, I'm just going to go pretty much straight into a little bit of a brief recap, followed by the recap of the sessions, uh, four through six. And then per usual, I'm going to go into a little bit of like a DM insight uh, type of rant where I give a little bit of just background knowledge that I have that the players don't and hopefully it'll be a little bit a uh, little bit of entertainment to kind of see the behind the scenes so to speak and again i want to preface that when it gets to that dm insight section if any of my players are watching please do not watch that section you can watch the recap and all that uh before but once it gets to the dm insight do not watch that part it's just going to be full of spoilers and i would very highly appreciate you do not spoil the campaign for yourself now I'm going to go over a very brief recap of basically what I did in the first video. So where the story is taking place, my world, a little bit of the themes in it, and a very brief recap of the characters, kind of reintroducing them very briefly. So the plot of the story is the party has joined up with the Shepherds of Freedom, this resistance group that is going up the ranks of the Dentonian Empire trying to overthrow the Emperor. The Emperor is this highly traditional and tyrannical man who has put a whole bunch of laws in place to persecute and discriminate against all different types of people within the Empire, only allowing a select few individuals to truly have full freedom within it. And the story takes place within my world of Jedemire, within the lands ruled by this tyrannical Emperor of the Dentonian Empire. So my players are Anam, the Azamar Kinsei monk, Burra, the human fighter, Jasper, the water Ganazi alchemist, which is a homebrew class that he found, Kinkuru or Daru, as he initially introduced himself as, who is a human rogue, there is Retsu, a dwarven cleric, Skaxius, a human cleric, there is Tan, who is my NPC, who is a human drunken master monk, and then more recently there is Hua Young, who is a human samurai, and the newest member, Yomi, who is a half-elven warlock and Skaxius has since left as well. So it is including Tan, my NPC, a big eight person party. So it's at times a little much, but it's still very fun. A part of the story right now, everybody is there except for Yomi. Yomi has not met up with the group just yet. She comes in a little later and Skaxius has yet to leave. Basically when Skaxius leaves, Yomi basically comes in right after. So for the time being, everybody is there except for Yomi. Additionally, for a very brief explanation of where this session is going to start up again, I'm going to go through very quickly, so there's not going to be a lot of detail, it's just going to be kind of point for point. So if you want to get the full kind of uh, session uh, explanation, please go check out the first video, session uh, one through three. Uh, but besides that, I'm going to recap this and then I'm going to get right into the video. So the start of this session is going to be after the party met up with Murasaki, did a prison break within the town of Koseki, racing back into the Saketsui Mountains north of the town, stopping by, dropping off a bunch of refugees who they just broke out of the prison, continued to go through the Saketsui Mountains, fought off a small band of orcs and ogres and half-ogres. They continued even further north, going off the path and finding a village that Murasaki knew of and led them to. This village is the Anzanzi village. It is a village filled with all types of individuals who would be incredibly frowned upon should they be outside in the actual world of the Dentonian Empire. Here, anthropomorphic, like animalistic creatures as well as half-elves, half-orcs, and so on and so forth make their living off the beaten path and out of the central eye of the Empire. After greetings were had, Burra noticed a bit of a confrontation going on within the center of the village. Going to investigate, he found that there was this argument between many of the villagers claiming somebody had killed another member of the village. 
Burra speaking with the individual Theo Perch, this anthropomorphic fox-like creature. He was able to determine that this death, this murder, was not by the hands of Theo Perch, but rather a lycanthrope. With that, an agreement was had between the party as and the village. Should the party be able to take care of these lycanthropes, the village would offer them many supplies to get them through the Saketsu Mountains. With that, they went into the forest, found Henrik's body, who was the suspected individual that Theo Perch murdered, found the grisly scene, tracked it further up, fought a handful of lycanthropes, with the clerical powers of Skaxius and Retsu, they cured these individuals, or at least a handful of them, from their lycanthropy. The previous lycanthropes, now cured, then through hazy memory, told the party of a cave beside a log cabin further north. This cave was said to house just shy of two dozen lycanthropes. The party, with this knowledge, brought the individuals back to the Anzansi village, now cured of lycanthropy, and handed them over to the villagers to tend to. The party then killed a boar and brought it back to the village, where Jasper and Retsu concocted a poison that would induce a paralysis onto the lycanthropes. They poisoned the boar, then made plans to trek back through the forested mountains to this mouth of the cave. And that is where we were picking up. Without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and recap session four through six for everyone. So sit back and enjoy. With the poison concocted by Jasper and Ratsu within the Anzansi village, they placed it within a boar that party easily managed to kill, and began the journey to the mouth of the cave. After a little less than a day's travel, they arrived at a small clearing of trees next to the rising edge of one of the mountains. Here they found a simple wooden cabin that sat next to an even simpler wooden stables, big enough for two horses at most. Tucked behind both structures, the mouth of the cave could be seen. Memories came to Burra of the two that called this their home a half-orc man by the name of Borgar, and a half-elven man by the name of Rallis. Their cave grew a special herb that Burra and his organization used in many different practices. After taking in the site, they saw the remnants of blood that streaked across the ground back to the cave. Fearing the worst, the group of adventurers made a quiet approach. Tan and Kinkuru, or Veru as he was going by at this time, dragged the boar over to the mouth of the cave and then found a space to hide like everyone else. Entering the cave, they found most of the lycanthropes locked into positions of pain as the poison had attacked their bodies and caused a paralysis to come over them. Those who managed to withstand the poison took an aggressive stance against the party, who also went for their blades and focuses of the arcane or divine. Through martial prowess and good use of arcane and divine magics, the party managed to slay many of the beasts or free them from their curse. Once the fighting had come to an end, the party began to search the cave for any survivors, information, or useful loot they could get their hands on. In their search, the party found many things. The group found Borgar, tied up within a back chamber. He was beaten and bruised and told the group that the Lycans were trying to turn him. However, his resilience proved stronger than the curse, or it had for that long. Much longer and Borgar feared he would have succumbed to the curse. Rallis, however, was not so fortunate, Borgar painfully told them. It was also found that Rallis was one of the Lycans killed in the fray. After speaking with Borgar, Jasper and Daru managed to uncover a small treasure trove behind a stalagmite. This trove contained a good bit of gold, a few healing potions, some medicinal ointment, a beautifully carved and enchanted shield, and almost two dozen gems of varying worth. Retsu managed to find a vein of ore that he began to mine with some of the equipment within the cave. There he managed to chip away at a fair amount of precious minerals. Burra and Jasper then found a small section within the cave that acted as a small garden. It was deduced by Jasper and Burr that many of these plants could be used for antitoxins, healing ointments, and potions, and even fungi that could be used for potions of cold resistance. The most important thing found here, however, were three newly bloomed flowers of wolfsbane. This flower could be used in the concoction of potions to cure lycanthropy, or even crafted into a potion that would act as a potent poison when used against lycanthropes. Lastly, in a pile of leathers, broken wagons, and carts, and the half-eaten remains of those killed by the Lycans. Burra found one of his mentors within the organization he was from. Long dead and distinguishable only by some features, his clothes, and a crimson sash he wore with his belt. Burra gave a brief prayer over his body and rolled him into a piece of fabric found in the same pile. With nothing left to be found, the group along with Borgar and the Lycans, cured of their curse, followed the group back to the Ansensi village. Here, the village leader Nahul and the guardians Abelar, Akabi, Katsukado, 
Mato, and Dakota, welcomed them back and proudly accepted those now given a new chance at life into their village. With the proof of those saved from the lycanthropes, the village supplied the party with a number of supplies to last them through their travels to Hiwana, which would be their next stop in northern Taiyang. After a night's rest, the group carried on through the Siketsu Mountains with the supplies and some unexpected and unfortunate news uncovered by Burra. His mentor, one of many, now wrapped in being carried by Burra himself, who was determined to lay him to rest back at the organization's base, also further north. After leaving the village, they took part in a 27-day trek to Hawana. During this time, some of the group interacted with one another. Murasaki had a personal conversation with Anum, speaking of an unknown history between them, telling Anum that the last time she saw him, he was being carried by his mother on a ship being sailed out of the Dentonian Empire about 25 years ago. She then showed Anum a painting she drew of that moment. It was simple and very old, but it depicted passengers from all walks of life being valiantly led to the freedom by a man and woman, while the woman carried in her arms a small child no more than a year old. Anum was surprised and very happy to meet someone who, while he didn't know well, was such an ally and friend to him. Murasaki then proposed the question of asking if she could do another painting of Anum, a more recent one, accepting. She painted Anum's portrait and thanked him for it. Anum then began to make a conversation with the distant, cold-shouldered Tan, where they sparred with one another. And after some time, it was found that Tan was quite talented in his martial arts, and even stumped Anum from time to time with his free-flowing and swaying fighting style that was strange and unpredictable, but very effective. This broke Tan out of his shell a bit, and they talked and complimented each other on their abilities. For Anum, this was the first time Tan could really be seen opening up, even if just a little. Eventually, they arrived at Hawana after exiting the mountain range and entering the Kitamori Forest. Here, they all slowly made their way inside to not attract attention, as Hawana was the largest city within northern Taiyang. The city stands as a large trading post and huge supplier of lumber, herbs, and spices. Without Hawana, lumber would be a scarce commodity. The city itself is marked by an enormous tree that sits within its center. Seen as a blessing placed upon the city by the god of the sun, it is a highly worship marked by the community. After entering the city, the group carefully made their way, being led by Murasaki to the secret base of the Shepherds. This new base was a tea shop named the Timber Cup Tea Shop, and was run by the shepherd leader there, Estold Rigas. Estold is an elven man who is dressed in a simple yet well-tailored kimono. After a few knowing looks and a special order placed by Murasaki that requested a more private room for their group, they were led to the back room where a table surrounded by cushions was found. Here, Estold himself sat with the group and expressed his gratitude for their arrival. He also informed the party that there were a few tasks that needed to be completed, but a night's rest for the group would be important. So Estold allowed them all to have their tea before leading them into a secret back room that doubled as a storage area and a living quarters for a small number of shepherds. Here, Estold gave them a brief explanation of where they could set up their bedrolls before leaving back into the actual shop. As Estold was leaving, someone in the room began to approach, someone who didn't bear the colors or equipment of a member of the Shepherds, but rather armor very similar to Burra's. Approaching was a female forest gnome, adorned in dark red studded leather armor, and had light red hair that went past her shoulders. As the party turned to look, her eyes trained on Burra as she spoke out. Well, if my eyes don't deceive me, my nose surely doesn't, Burra. It's good to see you. Burra turned his attention to the gnomish woman, whose name he spoke, Cornella. They began to catch up with one another. Cornella gave a gesture to the room where Burra finally noticed that amongst the shepherds were more of his organization. A total of six students of his order, like himself, and two of his mentors, including Cornella and a severely injured halfling woman named Castrel Burrowhill. Together, the two mentors to Burra explained that their organization was attacked by two groups. One were lycanthropes, nothing they hadn't dealt with before, but this time they attacked in an overwhelming number. In addition to this, these people with white wooden masks with red that ran under the eyes and streaked down towards the chin also added to the lichen's numbers. Together they took their base of operation. Obviously some managed to escape, but besides the number here at the shepherd's base, it is hard to say how many truly made it out with their lives. Burra spoke about how he found another mentor, Sundar, within the mountains. With the conversation taking sour notes, they decided to be thankful that at least not all of them were lost, and headed to bed for some much-needed rest. After a night's rest, Estol discussed the loose ends that needed to be tied up before leaving Hawana. 
as a base that dealt in the assassination of those who were truly corrupt that gave the group a mission to intercept a band of samurai traveling to Ochiba Village outside of Hawana. The encounter fell heavily into the party's favor via an ambush, but after capturing the leader, the leader with a cockiness to him saw something of Skaxius that some of the others could not. He also prodded at Deru about how his family would be so disappointed in him for joining such scum. Going back to product Skaxius, it angered him and Skaxius took that opportunity to fire a radiant bolt into his chest, killing him. As the life drained from the samurai, however, he laughed, his eyes sunk into his skull, and moths began to rapidly crawl from his mouth and eyes as his body detonated like a bomb, releasing a wave of moths and necrotic energy that sapped away a portion of the vitality of those nearby. After his death, something had certainly come over Skaxius, even physically, as from his body tendrils of shadow swirled around him. Everyone was concerned about what was happening, especially Skaxius himself. The shadows eventually subsided, but what it was remains a mystery. Confused and very concerned about what had just happened in the forest with the samurai leader, Skaxius with his knowledge on religion and Retsu casting a lore-finding spell, they learned that these creatures were known as Ashura. These creatures are fiends from the Hells and can only be truly killed by that of an enchanted jade weapon. Otherwise, they reform the Hells, all of their memories intact, and continuously seek to find a way back into the plane. This discovery pushed the party to look to acquire jade within the city of Hoana. However, with some investigation around the large open market, they found that all of the jade in the Empire over the past year had been recalled from caravans, shops, and even jewelers. This was said to be for a great marriage ritual for the Emperor and his soon-to-be wife. With this new information, the party started to ponder where they might find Blades of Jade. Alright, well that was the video, that was the session recap. I hope you guys are entertained. Uh, so, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into a little bit of the, uh, the backstory and the background of all of this information and kind of where it's all coming from. So, once again, this is the part of the video where if any of my players are watching, I humbly ask you to exit out because the rest of this is just going to be very full of spoilers. First off, I want to say that if you want to get a little bit more detail, I went over a lot within the first video. I rambled for a very long time on all kinds of different information, so I know it's I know it's pretty long, but if you stick through it and you kind of watch it through, I give off a lot of information. However, I'm going to try and shorten that a little bit this time and kind of go over just a few points that are relevant to the story in particular here. So without further ado, uh, first and foremost, uh, those masks that were mentioned by uh, Cornella and Kestrel, Burroughs' mentors, those masks are worn by the Keepers of Belief, as that I explained in the last video. To briefly recap, however, the Keepers of Belief are a elite sect of radical traditionalists for the Dentonian Empire, who, if the law can't do it, they will do it. So they are radical, they are very horrid people. And once again, Kinkuru and Retsu are a part of them. And so they too have masks of their own. Retsu, however, uh, tore open and placed his mask within a pillow within the inn that they stayed at in Koseki. Kinkuru, or Deru, once again as he's going by at this point in time in the story, is still holding on to his. But all of the keepers have this. It is a white mask with red underneath the eyes that streaks down to the chin. It is a mask that all of the keepers have to wear when they are on missions. So if they are seen, they still cannot be distinguished by their facial features. So the second point I wanted to make was about Skaxius. Skaxius, as mentioned, he had these dark shadowy tendrils kind of released from his body. This is a manifestation of the demon that corrupts him. This demon is a part of his backstory that corrupted him when he was a child and had only been placed at bay by his pacted celestial patron. But within the Dentonian Empire, something has gone wrong. There is some type of blocking of divinity. Something is blocking specifically celestial divinity. And that is why Skaxius has went into the Dentonian Empire to try and fix this. But also, because of it, the Solaire that he is pacted with cannot keep at bay this entity. Rather, it is free to exert itself over Skaxius once again. 
but that does not mean he is lost of divinity. There is still clerics and paladins within the Dentonian Empire. However, direct communication is much more difficult. It's not as free, it's not as open. Those who are devout outside of the Dentonian Empire, if they have enough faith, they can have dreams and visions where their deity speaks to them. Within the Dentonian Empire, that is far from reality. The only thing that connects through are spells of divinity that are given to clerics or paladins, or in this case, warlocks as well, with the Pact of the Celestial. But this demon, because the Solaire does not have that direct connection anymore, cannot help Skaxius. And getting rid of the demon is incredibly easy, but nobody knows how to do it. In Skaxius's backstory, something that he did while he was corrupted was take the life of his brother. After doing so, he had constantly held on to his brother's necklace and worn it as a reminder to himself that he should never get that bad again, as well as just to remember his brother. However, that demon has latched on to that necklace. And the only way to be fully free from the demon is to destroy the necklace. The third point I want to talk about is the beacons that uh, Kinkuru has. So these beacons are little magically enchanted like stones, and they can be dropped anywhere. And the leader of the Black Phoenix Samurai has basically the receiving end of this spell. So wherever Kinkuru drops a beacon, the leader of the Black Phoenix Samurai can follow after it and locate it. And Kinkuru dropped a stone with an Onsensi, or the Onsensi village, and the Timber Cup Tea Shop, the shepherd's base within Hawana. And because the leader of the Black Phoenix Samurai, which the Black Phoenix Samurai is basically the left-hand man of the Emperor himself, and then furthermore, the Emperor's advisor is the leader of the Keepers of Belief, and the leader of the Black Phoenix Samurai is within the Keepers of Belief, there is this weird power dynamic where the Black Phoenix Samurai has been led to basically go and destroy the Shepherds. Kenkuru has joined within the ranks of the Shepherds of Freedom and plans to basically take them out from the inside, drop these beacons at all of their bases, and the Black Phoenix Samurai can come along, steamroll them, and keep moving them along until they are entirely wiped out. And the last bit of information that I wanted to speak on is basing off of the last bit of information. The Black Phoenix Samurai is heading towards the Onsensi village as we speak. And when they get there, they plan to burn it to the ground. And so that will be very interesting. And I will recap and inform you all of what goes on with that whole situation in the next uh, session when that becomes relevant. But in any case, that's pretty much all I have for this video, so I hope this was informative, enlightening, or at the very least entertaining, and I appreciate it.